You know, I've got to be honest, I, I find certain TV commercials very offensive, especially those ones that talk about young homeowners who are becoming their parents. I, I don't know if you identify at all with those, but I can, I can firmly remember some of those choices that Amy and I made in our early days. We had just bought our first house. We were excited about it. It was one of those that, that quite honestly needed to be dragged out of the late 60s when we bought it in the early 90s. And, and, and we were ready for the challenge. And shortly after we moved in, we started tearing into things. And we, we ripped down wallpaper that uh, was amazing. And we painted walls. And, and we got to the point in time where it was time to tackle the hallway bathroom in our, in our spacious little, what, 1,200 square foot house. Um, and, and, and it was a bathroom that looked like my grandma's bathroom. And I loved my grandma, but I didn't want her bathroom in my house. And so we painted the walls. And, and after we painted the walls, we realized that it, it just still looked like my grandma's bathroom because it had this really old light fixture that was hanging up there and we said that's got to go it it just has to go so Saturday morning dawned bright and fair and I tore into the job now you have to realize that uh, this was in the days before the internet before YouTube so we used these things we called books that would walk us through how to do changes to our house. Now, now, now books are old. Um, they're not as old as the stone tablets that Pastor Mark would have used back in his day. <laughs> I still have that book, actually. I saw it the other day tucked up underneath our bed for some reason. But I had my book and I had my headlamp on because it had told me to turn off the breaker before I dug into the project. And, and so I'm standing there in the bathroom with my book, you know, step-by-step -step pictures to, to guide me through it. I took the light down. I, I put the new one up, hooked it all up. And then I realized the light switch still looked like my grandma's light switch. And so we needed to take that out. So I took that out and we replaced it with the new one. Of course, in the process, we made like six trips to the hardware store. And I was so excited. We got the light switch installed. I went back out to the garage and tripped, flipped the breaker back on. I walked in, flipped on the light switch, and stood in the darkness of my bathroom. I thought, man, I did everything that the book told me to do. I walked through every one of those steps so carefully. And I got the book out again, and with the light from my headlamp, I was reading through the book, and I was thinking through it. I couldn't figure out what was wrong, but by then it was the end of the day. We were getting close to dark outside. I had to start thinking about getting ready for the next morning at church. And so we did what any good young homeowner would do. We ran extension cords. The problem was, not only was the bathroom dark, but so was the master bathroom and the master bedroom and another bedroom at the back corner of the house and the hallway. Somehow, something I had done had taken out half of the house. And so for that night and all day on Sunday, the next day, we had extension cords running here and there through the house to power different things just so we could survive until my buddy, who was a union electrician, could show up the next afternoon on Monday and, and help me figure out that that light switch not only controlled the light there, but, but also power to two other bedrooms, another bathroom in the hallway, all ran through that little light switch, and I had neglected to connect one wire. The broken connection had made it so that nothing worked. Today we're going to read John chapter 15 and we're going to start at verse 1. If you've got your scriptures with you, I would encourage you to grab those. We want to walk through this step by step today. As you're turning in your Bibles, I do want to welcome our folks up at North Campus. We're so excited about what God's doing and the work that you're doing there. Super fun to get to visit you from time to time and just enjoy the excitement that's there. Likewise, we'd welcome the folks just down the hall here at Main Campus and the Family Life Center. Uh, we welcome you if you're listening online, if you're playing catch up, and if you're Pastor Mark, who happens to catch this on his vacation, just joking about the earlier joke. So we get to uh, John chapter 15, verse 1, and we read, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now I have to admit to a certain degree of fear and trepidation this morning as we, as we speak on this passage, uh, this would be one of Pastor Mark's favorite scripture passages ever. And if it sounds kind of familiar, it's because he touched on this back in October as a part of a sermon series called Our Mission in Motion, and he, and he began to paint for us a picture of what Hope Church is going to be like in the future. And he encouraged us to embrace the part of this passage as a part of our own lives too. We're going to talk more about that later, but it's, it's a little intimidating to speak on your boss's favorite scripture passage. And if you want to go all the way back to almost two years ago, the very first time we welcomed Pastor Mark to preach here, he preached from this passage as well. So this one is near and dear to his heart, and that's because it's near and dear to God's heart for us as individual believers and as a corporate body. Let me just remind you of the context as we arrive here at, at chapter 15, verse 1. Uh, the last sermon series, This is the Way Forward, all came out of John chapter 14. And, and Pastor Mark taught us that's when Jesus was together with his disciples in the upper room. Jesus knew time was running short. Judas had just slipped away for his own appointment with destiny. And Jesus is sharing his last words with his disciples. And as Pastor Mark reminded us, last words are lasting words. And so Jesus isn't wasting words at this point. And at the very end of chapter 14, he looks at his disciples and says, come now, let us leave. And it's not as though the, the, the lasting words have stopped there. He continues to speak with his disciples as they walk. And as they walk, Jesus knows that at the beginning of this walk, he's leaving the upper room with the disciples, but he knows at the end of the walk, he has his own very important appointment with death and redemption for us as his children. It's a pretty important time in the life of Jesus with his disciples. So this morning we want to look at the four major players in the passage. You see him right there in, in the first couple of verses. I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. That sums them all up. This is the seventh and final I am statement that we find in the book of John. As you know, those seven statements all begin with I am, and they all drive very important points home that Jesus wants us to understand and to stick on our lives. The very first major player is the true vine. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now Jesus is once again employing a very important teaching tool that we still use today. If you teach a class, if you lead a small group, if you lead in your home, if you're discipling your kids, wherever you're teaching, a lot of times we use these illustrations, don't we? Little stories or comparisons that help our human minds grab truth and hang on to it in very real ways. I, I already used one this morning in talking about replacing that bathroom light. It's something that we use as, as leaders that helps us connect to things and remember them when they're really important to remember. Here Jesus says, I am the true vine. And at that point in time, he's starting to paint a picture that he wants his disciples to truly understand. Now, it's really interesting on this particular illustration because up until this point in history, Israel had always been the vine. If you go back and read all through the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, you see constant references to Israel being the vine. God's chosen people, God's folks. His followers were always the vine. And in the past, that comparison, that illustration was always like nine times out of ten, 9.9 .9 times out of ten. It was used as a form of rebuke because Israel had fallen away. And time after time, as we read through scripture, we see that Jesus is cutting down the vine because of some sort of unfaithfulness of God's people to their father. 
There will be another time that, that, that this illustration will be applied to God's people. It comes in Revelation chapter 14 where John writes about um, a time when unfaithful believers will face God's wrath. So in the past and in the future, the vine will be Israel. But today, Jesus says, I am the vine. And that would have caught the ear of his disciples. That would have caught the ear of anybody that they happened to be walking past. Chances are good as they made this walk from the upper room to Jesus' ultimate appointment with death and redemption for us as believers, they were walking through vines. They would have been walking past vineyards. And so Jesus would be pointing out to them as they walked. It would have been a very real illustration for them to understand. Jesus says, I am the true vine, which in this immediate context tells them, I am not like the religious leaders who have been false, who have fallen away. I am the true vine. I am the one you can trust. For us today, it means that Jesus is the true vine. It's not a, a distracting vine that has led us apart from him. It's not something fake that imitates the true vine. He says, I am the true vine. The second major player in the passage would be the gardener. And, and right there he tells us, my father is the gardener. And with that, Jesus is not saying, I am less divine than the father. Instead, it's an act of submission to show that the Father leads the Son, the Father brings life through the Son to us as the branches. You know, when I was a kid, we had a, a grape vine that grew in our backyard. My dad had constructed this grape arbor made out of boards and, and, and wires and things. And honestly, it just wasn't awesome at our house as a kid. Uh, my dad was a psychology professor, my mom was in education, and, and I was the youngest kid in the family that got stuck behind the lawnmower, and none of us took care of that vine. It just kind of always grew there, and occasionally it would produce some grapes at a certain point in the year, but most often it just produced these really lame, kind of shriveled up kind of grapes that only attracted bees that stung when you would push the lawnmower past it. My parents were awesome. They were not grape uh, gardeners. They didn't know what they were doing. They, they, they plant it and it grows grapes, right? We needed a gardener that could come along and, and take care of that grapevine and, and make it what it was meant to be. We needed somebody to come and, and, and to teach us how to prune that thing so it would grow right. I mean, we just assumed the more of the vine there was, the better the chances of, of a harvest. And that's not at all accurate. We needed somebody to come and to prune that and, and cut away the dead parts that had fallen, fallen alongside. We needed somebody to come and, and cut off the extra parts of the growing vine so that the vine's energy could go into producing good and quality grapes. I had to laugh that a couple of summers ago when my parents eventually sold that house where they had lived for 49 years, that grapevine was still there. <laughs> And it was still producing these really ugly, shriveled up, icky kind of grapes that only attracted trouble for anyone who was around it. If the father is the gardener, he has the ultimate responsibility for pruning that vine to make it do what it was supposed to do from the time that it was planted. And that vine has to be willing to be pruned. And many times we as believers resist the gardener when he comes to prune us. The third major player that we see here in this passage would be the branches, and that's us. That's you and I. That's the individual believers that make up the greater body that's called the local church, the corner of the vine of the kingdom that is Hope Missionary Church. The branches are there for, for a certain job, and, and, and we're going to talk more and more about their job as we go this morning, but I need you to understand that, that what these branches are all about has been spoken of numerous times in Scripture with all sorts of different illustrations. The branch stays connected to the vine, and if Jesus is the vine, we are this branch that goes out from it with a certain purpose. But this morning, we want to look right here at that connection between the branch and the vine. 
And it's really, really important. Important enough that we know that Jesus talks about it in several different ways, several different illustrations throughout his ministry on earth. He ta- uh, Paul writes about the body and its members in 1 Corinthians 12. He's describing that connection. Uh, Paul writes about the bride and the bridegroom in Ephesians 5. Jesus talks about the sheep and the shepherd. It's that same connection. We just talked about it uh, Monday evening in the small group that Amy and I are part of. It's that connection between the sheep and the shepherd, between the bride and the bridegroom, between the branch and the vine. It's not our job as a branch to compare ourselves to the other branches, is it? But if we're really honest, we tend to spend a lot of time comparing ourselves to the other branches, don't we? It's so easy to look at our own branch life and say, oh, look how beautiful my branch is. I wonder what's wrong with their branch. That's not our job. That's a trick of the enemy that gets us distracted from the connection that we're supposed to be paying attention to. For the branch's true responsibility is to maintain the connection to the central vine so that we can do our job that he has for us. Obviously, the fourth major player in this is the fruit at the end of the vine. And so if Jesus is the vine, we are the branch, and the fruit takes place out here. And the fruit is the end goal in the kingdom. It's not results. It's fruit. It's not results. It's fruit. Machines and computers produce results. Fruit can only come from a living organism. And that's hard, isn't it? Because everything in our society is set up to talk about results. What are the numbers? And that even leaks into ministry a lot. It's easy for us to get caught up in trying to produce ministry results. My first ministry uh, was at a, a local church. I was working with middle school students, and we wanted to produce results. And so on Thursday mornings, we began to host a prayer breakfast for middle school students to come and pray for their friends. The intent was good, but somewhere along the line, we missed producing fruit and we went for results. It was a cooperative effort between many churches in our community and we met right at a church that was right across the street from the middle school, so it was perfect. Thursday mornings, students, come on out and pray for your friends. And and we opened our first prayer breakfast with those students and only a handful came but we wanted fruit no we wanted results and so the youth pastors got together and decided we need something to help get these students to come to the prayer breakfast where they can pray for their friends and so we started advertising breakfast would be crispy creams and mountain dew you want results with middle school students packed house Honestly, if you want results with adults, we'd all be there too, right? I mean, it was awesome. You couldn't contain the crowds. And we thought we were doing it all. We thought we were producing fruit, but we were just getting results at that point. And we kept that going. A series of months went by, and finally I got a phone call at my office from the principal of the middle school. And he said, Pastor Kent, we are so excited that you have a heart for our students but can you please feed them something else? We can't do anything with them after you bring them across the street. They're so wound up on sugar and caffeine, we can't do anything. We mixed up fruit and results. It's an easy temptation for us to fall into. The fruit that's being spoken about here is is actual fruit. It's not something that we produce It's something that comes as a natural outflow as the energy comes from the vine through the branch and is produced where fruit is produced. So there are three steps that come in this process that we're talking about this morning. And and they're they're really easy to see if we look at it. Uh, If you look right there at the beginning of verse 2, we read about fruit. Branches produce fruit, Jesus says. And then he goes on from there almost immediately at the very second part of verse 2. And he says, he wants us to produce more fruit. 
And then if you keep going, just three verses later in verse 5, we read about much fruit. And the goal is not just to, for the vine to, through the branches to produce uh, wimpy little grapeish kinds of things like the grape arbor at my house when I was a kid. Jesus says, no, I want you to produce fruit. And on top of that, I want more fruit. And I want much fruit from you. It's a progression that we sign up for. It's something super important. So what is this fruit that comes as we stay connected to the central vine of Jesus? Well, it's really easy to define that because they've already done that for us in the word. Paul writes, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And here's the connection. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's the connection from the branch to the vine that brings life so that we can produce the fruit. So that fruit of the Spirit is what gets produced out here. And it, and, it, and it lives its way out through praise to the Father, through sharing the gospel and seeing conversions happen. It's, it's sacrificial love that's expressed to other people. It's those same three things that Pastor Mark spoke of last week when he talked about revivals taking place on college campuses around the Midwest and across the country right now. It's the fruit that's coming through the branches to be produced at the end. As I studied this week, I, I opened up one of my favorite commentators. His name's Warren Wearsby. And he writes, the more we abide in Christ, the more fruit we bear. And the more fruit we bear, the more the Father has to prune us so that the quality keeps up with the quantity. Left to itself, the branch might produce many clusters, but they will be inferior in quality. God is glorified by a bigger crop that is also a better crop. And so as we sign up to be a living branch that's connected to the vine so that we can produce fruit and much fruit and more fruit, we also sign up to a continual process of production and pruning so that the production can continue to increase. It's an ongoing act that we sign up for as a branch. So let's talk about those branches. We've talked about the four major players. We've talked about the three steps in the process. Let's talk about the two types of branches. And again, this will sound very familiar because Pastor Mark just spoke about it about five months ago. He talked with us about two years ago as well. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So the first type of a branch is, is the fruitless branch. Pastor Mark talked about it as sticks, because that's what they are. They're just dead. They don't have any life, because if they had life, especially life that is connected to the vine, they're going to produce fruit. And they're just sticks. About a week ago, it was one of those beautiful Saturdays here. I don't know if you remember, 50 degrees, sunny. And, and I, I couldn't stop myself from being outside. Amy was making fun of me that day because I was doing anything I could to be outside. And I found myself just for the purpose of being outside, walking around our backyard, picking up these fruitless branches that had been blown out of our trees by a storm. I spent probably an hour just out there picking up branches. You know, at first I said, I'm going to start with the big ones. And I, it was so beautiful. I was down to, you know, picking up little things about the size of my finger just so I could still be outside. And what did I do with those? I took them over to our fire pit and started a fire and just got rid of them. That's what fruitless branches are for. They're for burning. I didn't, I didn't, know that I was doing a scriptural act on that Saturday when I burned the branches. It's just what you do with a branch. Honestly, gang, fruitless branches look exactly like they're described. There, there's no fruit out there at the end. 
They tend to get focused just on themselves and their desires and their wants. And they forget about the need to stay connected to the vine. There's danger in fruitless branches. They harbor insects and disease. They harbor dissension and division and discouragement. And those aren't just my words. That's scripture. When we read earlier from, from Galatians 5 where Paul was writing about the fruit of the Spirit, if we go to the verses just before those, we read about what branches do, what sticks do. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will be cut off by the gardener and thrown into the fire. Those are the fruitless branches. And we see those in John 15 over and against the fruitful branches, the ones that are producing fruit due to their connection to the vine. Just like the fruitless branches, the fruitful ones are best defined by how they're described. They're fruitful. They're, they're full of fruit. And they are producing not just the fruit of the Spirit within them, but that has driven them to the point that they are producing praise and they're producing other believers around them and, and they're producing sacrificial acts of love, the marks of revival that we see around us. Fruitful branches are engaged not just with other people that speak and look and think and act like them, but they're purposely and intentionally engaged with other people who don't look and think and act and smell like them. They pay attention to the least and the lost and the lonely. They understand that they have to cultivate that connection to the vine so that his power can flow through them as the branch to produce fruit out at the end. Going back to my friend, Mr. Wearsby, your heavenly father is never nearer to you than when he is pruning you. Sometimes he cuts away the dead wood that might cause trouble, but often he cuts off the living tissue that is robbing you of spiritual vigor. It can also mean cutting away the good and the better so that we might enjoy the best. Yes, pruning hurts, but it also helps. We may not enjoy it, but we need it. And so the master gardener, the father himself, not only is cutting away the dead branches, the sticks, but he's also right there next to the living branches that are connected meaningfully to the vine. And he's cutting away the distractions. He's cutting away the things that we're pursuing apart from him. And yeah, sometimes it hurts. Every Tuesday morning, I sit down with Pastor Mark in his office. And we sit and we talk about things related to Hope Church. And the very end of that meeting is always a, a few minutes of him being used by the gardener to prune my life. And sometimes it hurts. It hurts when not only my friend, my, my boss, but, but our senior pastor looks at me and says, hey, you know what, you're kind of getting some things off here. Let, let's prune that back some. And then every other Wednesday, I sit down with my accountability partner, Rick, and, and he's even less nice about it. <laughs> and we sit and we share life together over a cup of coffee and and he, he tries really hard to phrase it nicely. And he'll, he'll often say to me, have you, have you ever thought about doing it this way? And sometimes that hurts. But I know that that's the father's action, the gardener's action in my life, pruning away so that better things can come. I'm just going to be honest with you. Pruning hurts as an individual. It hurts as a body. 
In the last few months, Hope Church has been in a pruning season. And it hurts when the Spirit prunes us as individual believers. But it also hurts when the, when the gardener prunes away other branches that we're close to. It hurts a lot. And the leadership here at Hope is aware of that because it hurts them too. The elders, the deacons, the staff, we talk about it some, we pray about it more. And if you're a branch that's hurting because other branches nearby have been pruned away, I want to encourage you. There's a gardener who is so, so close. And he loves you. And he wants you to become all of the branch that you can be so that you can produce all of the fruit that God's got for you to produce in the kingdom. So how does he do that? Well, he does it with one foundational truth in our lives. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. It's all in remaining in the vine. Eleven times in eleven verses, we come across this word remain. Remain, remain, remain. It's like it's important to Jesus in his final I am statement. His final, some of his final last words that he wants to be lasting with his disciples. Remain in me. Why is it so important that we remain in the vine? Why is it so important that we keep cultivating that connection to the vine? Neither can you produce fruit unless you remain in me. We, we, we can't do anything out here if we're not connected here. If we try to do it on our own out here, without this connection, nothing's going to happen. That's why when Pastor Mark preached about this five months ago, as he talked about the vision for Hope Church and the vision for individuals who attend Hope Church, it all boiled down to one phrase at the very end. And he reminded us that we will personally and corporately stay connected to Jesus. That was the core value that morning. That's, that was one of the seven statements that Pastor Mark made as a part of that series to help us understand what God's got for Hope Church. And it all comes down to this. And on that morning, he said, if we, no matter what else we do, if we get this wrong, it's all for nothing. Now, I love Pastor Mark. But he was plagiarizing that morning. <laughs> He was plagiarizing Jesus himself because in verse 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If we don't get the connection to the vine right, we risk becoming a stick that produces nothing. So I replaced the bathroom light and the light switch and we lived on extension cords because the connection was broken. And because the connection was broken, much of our house could not function. It couldn't do what it was supposed to do because of the broken connection. It didn't just affect the one room, it affected half of our house. Same thing is true of vines. When we lose the connection to the vine, it affects not just us as that particular branch. It affects the branches around us. It affects the whole vine. It affects the body, as Paul wrote about it in, in Corinthians. So the question this morning is simple. Are you a branch? Do you, do, are, are, are you a branch that is maintaining a connection? Are you working hard at cultivating that connection, that relationship to Jesus, so that you can produce the fruit that God's got for you to produce for the kingdom? Or are you one of the fruitless vines? 
the sticks. And if you answer the question, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a stick this morning. I want you to hear loud and clear. The gardener is the master gardener. And the gardener can bring new life to dead things. He's done it all at least once for every one of us who is an individual believer in Jesus right now. And the gardener longs to bring new life back to the sticks. Father, help us not to compare our branch life with the branch life of the other branches around us. Father, help us to not fall for that distraction. Lord, help us instead to focus in on the connection that we have to the true vine. God, it's so crucial that we get that right because if we don't get that one right, no matter what else we're doing, it's all for naught because apart from you, we can do nothing. We love you, Lord, and we trust you as the master gardener in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.